If you haven't already, see part 1, and make sure to both like and subscribe, it really helps. Episode 22, Future Shock. This episode opens up with the crew, minus Mendel, chasing after a mutation out at sea. Shortly after, the characters get caught up in a storm, which somehow time-traveled them to the future. A bleak one at that. They then encounter a creature called Dragma, which chases after them, but thanks to the help of a kid voiced by Bobby Hill, that thing's a Dragma and there are thousands of them. They manage to escape and meet back up with Mendel, who looks like he now put down the Twinkies and decided to get jacked up for war. He explains that shortly after Nick and the others disappeared, the Dragma creatures emerged out of nowhere and started terrorizing the world, even taking down Godzilla and the other monsters. Nick questions what time period they're in, and Mendel replies with, 18 AD, that's after Dragma, but by the Roman calendar, it's 2022. I know if Hollywood would have only made six more Ghostbusters films, this would be oddly accurate. Anyway, they soon encounter Hicks, who explains that the Dragmas were created by a guy named Jonathan Inslee. Never heard of him. They then get the idea to go back in time to try and stop Inslee from creating the monsters. By going through the storm again? You know, I don't really understand how the storm is doing all this. But if anyone and anything can go back and forth through time, then what's stopping the Dragmas from doing so? Fair enough. Anyway, they get back to the present day, stop the mutated jellyfish, apparently that's what this was, and they soon find Dr. Inslee and start raiding his facility without any search warrants. Technically, they could get in a lot of trouble for this. But Inslee seems more preoccupied on telling them how he loads technology. Computers run our lives. We're lost without our cars and cell phones and microwaves. You know, in this day and age, he's not that wrong. He releases the Dragmas, but lucky for the group, the creatures haven't fully manifested to their strengths that they had in the future, so they get taken out more easily. And Dr. Ainsley, I guess, gets arrested for nothing he's committed yet. Joking aside, this episode is by far one of the more darker stories of the show. I mean, this is a kid's cartoon, not shying away from death here. This is a good episode, but I feel it could have been a great one. Again, this is one of those stories that could have definitely benefited in a two-parter. Maybe with the first episode taking place mostly in the future, with the characters trying to find a way back to the past, and explaining how they're able to do so. It would definitely help than just having a random storm manifest and becoming a gateway between the future and the past. I don't know, maybe it's something I'm thinking too deep into. 9 out of 10. Nigel Death is nothing. If anything, he gets an upgrade in this episode, so good for him. Episode 23, Cash of the Titans. This episode wastes no time getting into the action, as a giant water beetle traps the group, and Godzilla is a no-show. They make their escape by using Nigel as a battering ram, and rendezvous with Animal and Audrey. I should note now that Nigel doesn't get torn up in this one again, so we're just going to be skipping that segment here too. Anyway, the crew soon find out the reason on why Godzilla never showed up. Turns out he was kidnapped. Again. I mean, this is like, what, the third time he's been caught? He was taken this time by a man named Maximilian Spiel, who apparently is a promoter on fighting sports. A very wealthy one on that, if he's able to both build an entire arena that can't be damaged easily, and cage giant monsters inside the vicinity. Did I also mention he owns his own private island? Anyway, Spiel kidnapped Godzilla so he can use him for his giant monster death matches, along with other oversized mutations. Nick and the others get to the place and infiltrate it, but quickly get caught and thrown onto the field where a battle is taking place. Godzilla is at a disadvantage with Spiel blinding him during a two-on-one match. But Craven manages to come up with a way to stop that. Freeing Godzilla's sight, he beats the monsters, Spiel dies, and the day is... well, not necessarily saved, but Godzilla is free again. A pretty entertaining episode all around. I never saw this one as a kid, but I definitely would have gotten my Godzilla toys and had my own little kaiju tournament right after. I just love episodes like this. 8 out of 10. Episode 24, Scale. This is a pretty unique episode compared to the rest, because for the entire runtime, save for the last bit, is viewed by way of camera angles, similar to that of Cloverfield or Chronicle for a better example. The episode mainly centers around Audrey and Animal as they try and document the story of Monster Island existing by stowing away on the Heat Seeker with the rest of the gang to said island. The plot here is pretty much a sequel to the Monster Wars trilogy, as even the Leviathan aliens are mentioned in passing here, along with some other phrases. That's the mutant bat that leveled the Eiffel Tower! An activist group called Scale, which means this mouthful of a name, is led by a woman named Alexandra Springer, 
who infiltrates Monster Island, takes everyone hostage, and frees all the monsters who then proceed to battle each other. Also, I guess she doesn't mind getting eaten by the creatures. Take us children! Feast upon me! Okay. The new monster here, Skeetera, which sounds like a name Toa would have came up with, gets the upper hand on most of the creatures and grows stronger by sucking their blood. Godzilla comes in to deal with it, and thanks to a single tail swipe, the overgrown mosquito is tossed right into the power plant, frying it up. Springer then goes crazy and tries to blow up the island, with her and everyone on it, but the military manages to stop her suicide massacre, and the day is saved. I personally don't care for these found footage type ideas, but I gotta give the creators credit here for trying something new. I also like how they keep it real here by not throwing in the soundtrack for this one, for the most part, which is good because music definitely would have taken me out of the immersion that this is found footage. Also, if this is taking place after the Monster Wars, then where the hell are all the other mutations? Not counting Godzilla or Skeetera, there's only three monsters here. Where's El Gusano, or the rat creature that didn't participate in the attack? No, oh, it's whatever. It's cool that some of them came back at least. Oh, and if you didn't know, Springer here is voiced by Linda Blair of The Exorcist fame. Kinda cool seeing a once horror star appear in a Godzilla cartoon of all things. 7 out of 10. Nigel death, 2 out of 5. So the group while captive tries to use Nigel to call for Godzilla. But thanks to Randy messing with the robot, Nigel instead of calling Godzilla begins rapping. This one ranks pretty low because not only do we not get to see his demise, but I also feel this moment was kind of done at an inappropriate time. Episode 25, Protector. The gang travel this time to the Middle East to find a giant oil sucking creature called Norzog. Which I have to say is a ridiculous sounding name even for a Godzilla monster. Both he and the military catch the giant in an act of eating oil and try to stop it, but with no luck. Godzilla then comes into tangle with it, but even the big cat proves too much for him. It is cool however to see Godzilla actively save the crew from getting squashed though. The characters later find out the story of Norzog and soon come up with a plan of action to stop it. By spraying some sort of chemical on it that hardens its skin and having Godzilla drag it out into the water where the ancient cat rusts and is stopped for good. Pretty average episode, nothing bad, but nothing special about it either. Norzog, despite the goofy name, is at least a unique creature for the Godzilla franchise. 5 out of 10. Nigel death, 4 out of 5. So Craven sends him down to get a closer look at the creature until Nigel accidentally wakes it up, gets burned, then is thrown as a fireball back at the characters. It's a pretty over the top but really cool death. Episode 26, Freak Show. So a couple of guys who were up to no good starting attacking Godzilla out in the neighborhood. Okay, don't worry, I'm not really gonna do the whole song. But my god, Godzilla's getting kidnapped again? What is he, like Princess Peach here? Nick and the others stop the kidnapper's attempt and ask why they're doing this, to which a convenient biplane passes by advertising Tobias Wilson's Mutant Mania, a circus dedicated to showing off mutations as entertainment for the public. Apparently the place is run by Tobias, along with Mayor Eber who supports the big top. It feels a little out of character for him to be doing that, but it's still nice to see him back. Oh, and he also dyed his hair back to gray again. While the guys are there, they happen to witness a creature managing to escape its cage. A monster known as Medusa, who is able to absorb the water from anyone or anywhere it touches. Doing so causes her to grow larger. She can also liquefy herself by means of escaping, making her a very deadly and tricky adversary. Even Godzilla fails to stop her in their first encounter. Heat, however, soon comes up with an idea to use an oil skimmer to suck up the creature while she's in her liquid state, which manages to work. Oh, and if you cared, Tobias gets arrested. To. And no, the humans that were absorbed by Medusa aren't dead. They're just very dehydrated, but they're overall fine. A very tense episode that reminded me a lot of the Breeder Beast episode from the old cartoon, with a blob-like creature running amok all over town, and both Godzilla and the military failing to stop it. The ending, like the Breeder Beast, is a little anticlimactic, but it's fine. 7 out of 10. Nigel death? Nada. He doesn't even appear in this one. Episode 27, End of the Line. So this one opens up with Nick and Audrey both preparing to make a big life decision for one another, when out of nowhere a giant turtle disrupts the moment, leaving the two stranded out at sea as the ship sails away. They then go to a remote island and try and make do till some help arrives, but unfortunate for them they pick the land where the big snapper likes to hang out. While running for their lives, a giant fire-spitting reptile called Komodo Trex, I think that's how you pronounce it, arrives on the scene and battles with the turtle, fleeing it off. 
Interesting to know here, this thing was originally supposed to be another Godzilla, but was changed at the last moment due to the producers not wanting to have another Godzilla walking around. Kind of funny they say that now when they didn't have a problem with it before. Anyway, Nick and Audrey stumble across a small tropical area where the big girl lives, and soon meet up with the rest of the gang who are following Godzilla to the location. Apparently Godzilla came to the big girl to perform a mating dance. Yeah, Godzilla's fallen in love and wants some privacy. Soon military men show up and order an immediate attack on all the monsters on the island. Godzilla and the baby included. Now, don't get the wrong idea. It's already been stated before that this Godzilla can't reproduce, and he's only playing surrogate daddy to Komodo Trex's offspring. The rest of the episode then becomes an all-out battle with Komodo Trex versus the military versus Turtle versus Godzilla with the unfortunate demise of pretty much all the new creatures in this episode. And the show ends on kind of a sour note. This episode has become somewhat of a fan favorite amongst people who enjoy the show, and I can kind of see why with all the new monsters and the intense action all around. There also seems like there's a few censored moments here and there. Whenever the turtle bites, the show seems to cut away very fast. I'm sure they didn't animate it as a bloody mess, but you never know. Come on. You hate the gory parts. Interesting little note here is that all the monsters featured in this episode actually appeared in the anime series Godzilla Singular Point in the form of plushy dolls in episode 6, along with Godzuki and Kong from the animated series. That's pretty cool, I never noticed that at first. 8 out of 10. Nigel Death, 1 out of 5. So Nigel's used to lure Godzilla away from the island while the military launched an assault on his new girlfriend. Godzilla manages to catch up to Nigel, chomps down on the robot, and that's that. Episode 28, what a long, strange trip it's been. So right away, Godzilla's battling another mutation, a giant germ creature classified as Basiculus, which is an actual bacteria. The germ cuts Godzilla open and infects the big guy. I'm honestly shocked the producers let this moment even happen. What else is shocking to me is that Godzilla's blood is now green? Even though in the first episode it's clearly red, but whatever. Anyway, Godzilla beats the bacteria on the outside, but not on the inside, as the big guy has now come down with a fever, and the germs are now killing him on the inside, leaving Nick and Monique to go inside him to try and stop the infection from getting worse. Anyway, the giant germ actually survived the battle and makes its way to the New York Reservoir. Nick and Monique succeed in getting Godzilla healthy again, and Godzilla burns the giant germ away for good. A very gruesome episode for a kid's cartoon, though I guess if the magic school bus could do it, then what's the harm in Godzilla doing so? 7 out of 10. Nigel death is kind of tricky here. I would have given it a 1 since the bacteria attack him off screen, but in the end he actually comes out fine. Episode 29, Wedding Bells Blue. If you couldn't guess from the title, somebody's getting married. Whoa! Somebody's getting married! And it's Elsie's sister, who's never been brought up till now. And surprise, she doesn't want to go. Well, not really. She's just a tad jealous of her sister, who always gets treated as the family favorite between her parents, whom I guess don't recognize she's part of a team that stops giant monsters. Speaking of, the team is called about one and they go to investigate. Except for Elsie, who has to go rehearse for the wedding, which apparently is today. Don't these things usually take some time to prepare? Anyway, Nick and the others soon encounter the Threat of the Week, which is a giant mutated mana ray, which has the power to freeze things. Originally, the mana was meant to be a bird creature, but got changed once the staff realized they already had some bird creatures in the works. I kind of wish they went with this design. It looks really cool. Godzilla shows up to fight it, but with not much luck. Nick and the others soon realize that the creature seems to be a attracted towards freezing climates. They then come up with a plan to lure the mutation into a ice hockey ring where it can rest, until Hicks and the military arrive to take it to Monster Island, I presume. Now, we wouldn't have much of an episode if things went according to plan, and of course they don't. The creature manages to escape and ironically flies towards the wedding. The military then proceeds to attack the creatures while putting civilians at risk, and Godzilla comes in and creates a whirlpool which drags the creature under the ocean. Or I guess it died? Maybe, I don't know with this show. Oh, and at the end of it all, Elsie also gained the respect from her parents. Also, Elsie's dad here is voiced by Robert Forster, who would go on to play Ed the Disappearer from the Breaking Bad franchise, and even that wizard guy from that goofy D-Wars movie. Rest in peace, you legend you. 8 out of 10. Nigel Death, 4 out of 5. It's been a while since we got a decent one. Nigel, whom Mendel forgets to put on silent, wakes the Manta Ray up and gets frozen, then smashed up. <laughs>
Episode 30, Metamorphosis. This one starts off with an anonymous donor donating $5 million to Heat for their services. And right on time, cause some money problems finally caught up with them. Now, five mega mills sounds too good to be true. So what's the catch on this one? Well, you'll have to wait and find out. Soon after, the team get a call about a giant bug terrorizing an amusement park and they go to see if they can stop it. Good to know they're still at work, even though they're getting a generous donation. Come to think of it, does the city even pay them to do this? I mean, who's their investors? Anyway, this giant bug called Megapede starts terrorizing the carnival until Godzilla shows up to lose, I mean, fight the monster off, and look at that, he has to retreat. You know, I never noticed till now how much this Godzilla loses a lot or has to back off during his first fight. I get they can't have him winning right in the beginning of the show, but just having him lose like this over and over is kind of embarrassing. Even the old cartoon found ways to keep him out of the action till the show was nearly over. After the fight, Megapede retreats underground, forms a cocoon, and comes back as an adult Megapede. I should note now that the Megapede creature was inspired from Mothra, and maybe even a little bit of Batra in there. Megapede flies into town, lands on a tall building, and starts doing a mating call with its wings, which creates this loud obnoxious noise. Interestingly, a scene in Godzilla vs. Megagaris would have done a similar moment that same year. Wonder if it was intentional. Anyway, the team managed to stop it from flapping. Godzilla comes in and brings the building down. They do a bit of fighting until Godzilla takes the big girl underwater and drowns her. Now, with the money subplot. You may think it's a prank or that the destruction Godzilla caused is going to come out of that. Well, no. They get the money and that's that. The subplot has no meaning whatsoever. It's just there to be there. In fact, this whole episode has a very off feel to it. Like this shot with Randy and Monique. I don't know why, but I feel like there's a cut moment here where he's supposed to be staring at her ass. Randy. There's a moment when Monique is spraying Megapede's wings with foam, and the wires get tangled to create some tension, but it quickly gets taken care of with little to no effort. Also, I guess Major Higgs called off sick today because he's nowhere around to tell the military not to attack Godzilla. The episode feels like it has an unpolished touch to it, but the final fight scene with the monsters is pretty entertaining, especially when they're jumping on the buildings. It's mindless fun. 5 out of 10. Nigel death, 2 out of 5. It's nothing special here, he's just clawed by Megapede and that's that. At this point, I'm seeking more uniquer kills. Episode 31, Area 51. Tell us the truth! Tell us the truth! energy, I forget it's 3 a.m. So for a quick context, Area 51, or Homie Airport as it's really called, is a secret military airfield located in Rachel, Nevada, that supposedly does both testing and training for military aircrafts. Though in reality, what actually goes on behind the scenes is top secret. Though many conspiracy theories that have been made throughout the years say that both aliens and UFOs are being kept in the facility away from the public eye, which is now what Area 51 is commonly know for. Now keep that in mind the moment we go into this. So the plot here is that the crew discover a new strange creature that has been burrowing around Area 51 and they go investigate. Area 51 is depicted here as a facility with these gigantic walls surrounding it and a bunch of people with nothing better to do than camp out around it till they find the truth that aliens exist, which our characters call them out on. I believe aliens welcome E.T. phone me? They're all such geeks. But now think about that for a minute. People in this show think that Area 51 is trying to cover up aliens from existing. Like were these people like half asleep during the Leviathan invasion? It doesn't even get mentioned here. And you know the writers knew they screwed up on that one. Because they keep having to say this. As I have stated repeatedly, there are no nor have there ever been extraterrestrials in Area 51. So, to the point, this Area 51 doesn't house aliens, it houses mutations for research. But a big armadillo and the main threat, called the Thorny Devil, manage to escape, start causing trouble, and get put down. Well, the armadillo gets to go back, but Godzilla ends up frying the big red lizard. Admittedly, I was not expecting that. A decent episode, even if it makes no sense in concept. There's also a lot of media that gets mentioned here. Hey, I don't diss the young and the restless. Destroy all monsters. We're familiar with that philosophy. I've seen stranger things. 5 out of 10. Nigel death, 
2 out of 5. I'm ranking it low here because the death this time around is actually frustrating to watch. The crew are running away from an attack when Nigel gets left behind because his wheels get stuck on something and he dies. This is one of the few times I think the trope is kinda forced. Episode 32, The Twister. Time for the lovely beach episode, everyone's favorite filler moments in TV shows. Too bad the characters get their free time ruined by an out of nowhere twister that wrecks things up. Soon after, Nick and Elsie discover that the weather patterns today shouldn't have even formed a tornado, and said storm has been reported repeatedly throughout the area. After a little investigating, it turns out that the twister is being created by a giant shrew that can somehow form a tornado and make it move in areas it really shouldn't be able to move in. Mendel then creates a machine out of nowhere that can somehow stop the shrewster from flying around the tornado. Yes, if you're wondering, that's what this thing is called, the shrewster. In a confusing matter of speaking, this thing actually made an appearance in an earlier episode, even though technically this episode is its first appearance. More on that later. The gang soon find the Shrewster, but fail to activate the machine in time, and it, along with Nick, gets swallowed up in the storm. Oh never mind, Nick is right there, driving everyone away to safety. Oh wait, that's only Monique. I guess she dressed up as Nick real fast before undressing back to herself. Nick, who is somehow not dead from being in this thing, manages to activate the machine and stop the tornado. But now they gotta get rid of the vermin. Enter Godzilla. Godzilla actually gets beaten to a bloody pulp here because of the Shrewster's speed. Wow, actual battle damage. You don't see that too often in this show. Nick manages to get the attention away from Godzilla and manages to trap the beast. But Godzilla doing the finishing touches, the monster is now going to get sent to Monster Island. Or to Spiel's Monster Tournament to fight a giant centipede. Okay, so here's a little piece of trivia for you all. The arrangement I've been reviewing the episodes in are that of the broadcast order, which didn't air the episodes in the correct lineup. Fox Kids would air the episodes in any order they chose, if there were special events coming up or holidays, things of that nature. Whatever would be a good attention grabber to correlate for whatever was coming up. But by doing it this way, there were some minor continuity errors. And monsters appearing earlier, such as the Shrewster and Cobra, appearing in episodes before their actual debuts. If you own the complete series on DVD by Mill Creek, which I'm sure you do, the episodes are placed in the correct order as intended. So, moving on now. The Twister gets a 4 out of 10. A decent episode, but not much else to say but that. Nigel Death, 5 out of 5. And what could possibly be the most heartwarming hurrah between creator and creation? Mendel reaches out to try and save Nigel from the storm, but unfortunately it's too late and our Spongebob voiced robot gets sucked away before his father's eyes. What a touching- oh wait, never mind, he's still intact. Oh, and he gets eaten off screen. Never mind, 1 out of 5. But wait, he's still around, somehow. I really thought he was chowed on. Boy, this episode really has some questionable continuity problems. Nigel does end up getting destroyed here, but he just gets crushed is all. No! Episode 33, Shafted. Heat is on their way to get some type of funding that involves bringing a laser. While stopping at a diner and almost killing some folks, they get word about an abandoned town called Blind Rock, to which some miners disappeared from 50 years ago. Honestly, they have no reason to go there, but do anyway. They soon encounter a young girl named Meg, whose brothers ventured into the mines and never came out. Naturally, they go to investigate to find them, while Monique, who has always worn this necklace, stays behind to keep an eye on Meg. Though Mendel actually volunteered to watch her first, but gets rejected. Kinda makes me question some things. Anyway, while inside, the group splits up to cover more ground. Group A finds the statues of the missing miners from 50 years ago, who are presumably dead, marking one of the few times this show acknowledges death. Now the question is, what did this to them? Well, Group B soon finds that out. It was done by a silver spitting creature called Hydra, which can spit out a liquid which turns anything into a statue. Back outside, Monique is playing big sister with Meg while pretending she doesn't care. Rule number one of combat, size matters. She soon gets word from Randy that they found the boys, and the two wander inside to... do something. There's plenty of encounters with the Hydra, or Hydras, and the show almost ends up feeling like a horror movie, similar to the Trust No One episode. Also, like that one, I forgot Godzilla was even in this show. He appears literally out of nowhere and saves the characters from being cornered. Like, how did he know they were even down here? The mines are not even by a body of water. It's just one of those times Godzilla's presence is forced into the show, just because it has to be. And it definitely proves true here, as the characters manage to beat Hydra without Godzilla's help. 
Kind of, I guess. The show then ends with Monique giving her necklace to Meg, because it definitely wasn't obvious that was gonna happen, and Meg winds up wearing it just to look like she's already lost it. Honestly, this is a pretty thrilling episode. I love when the show throws in horror aspects like this. 7 out of 10. Nigel Death, nothing. He's been replaced by a laser machine for this episode. Episode 34, Where is Thy Sting? So Godzilla out of nowhere travels to the New Mexico desert, supposedly in search of prey. When getting there, Randy gets stung by a scorpion and blacks out to this nightmare. Holy hell is this freaky. There's even mutated scorpion people. Damn, this is gonna be one terrifying episode, right? Well, no, the actual scorpion is just a big scorpion that can shoot acid. It's nothing really unique like the nightmare one was. Anyway, the team and Major Hicks soon discover that the scorpion is just a government experiment that went out of control, with the operation carried out by this suit named Charles Tarrington, who is both a friend of Hicks and a fellow golfer. You here for a rematch? Sorry Chuck, no time for a round of golf today. But he questions Hicks' thinking since Godzilla is still seen as a threat and wonders why Hicks hasn't taken him down yet. Interesting little note was that Mayor Ebert was supposed to be something like this, a reoccurring character who would always be against heat and would always come to the idea that Godzilla should be put down. Ultimately though, that was dropped and probably for the best, because Mayor Ebert's quite a funny character and seeing him reduced to this douchebag's level would be quite a turn for the worst. Yeah, Tarrington acts like an ass all around to the others, and anytime the monsters are fighting, he would always order the troops to fire on Godzilla, even if the big wizard saved him at one point. The scorpion eventually gets taken down along with little mutated scorpions I forgot to mention, and all seems at peace with Tarrington and our heroes, until the episode ends on a somewhat cliffhanger. Second wave crashed and burned. How long before third wave's online? For those who don't know, the big scorpion was classified as wave one, and the little ones as wave two. And whatever wave three would have been, I guess we'll never find out. Maybe it was just another big scorpion like wave one, but more friendlier to humans and sold off to Tobias Wilson's freak show attraction. No, seriously, that could be the case. Anyways, really good episode, nine out of 10. Nigel Death, five out of five. The brave robot gives his life to save the others from becoming Scorpion Chow, and also kind of aided in saving Godzilla. Episode 35, Lizard Season. It's a villainous reunion. We got Cameron Winters, the guys from Cat and Mouse, and I guess that's it. So Winters breaks the trio out of prison to help aid him in putting an end to Godzilla's life. By way of giant mechs, the three can just somehow pilot in an instant. Sure, why not? It's probably like driving a truck. Oh, by the way, the three have names now. Hank, Dale, and Bill. I guess if they had a fourth member, his name would be a bit too on the nose, if you get what I mean. Anyway, Monique goes back to her early season one mood and starts relenting against Godzilla by putting trackers on him and modifying the Heat Seeker to battle him. I don't know where the shift in tone came from all of a sudden this late in the show, but sure, why not? Godzilla soon encounters the robots and quickly realizes that three against one is kind of unfair. So he tries to avoid fighting them by way of running away. Cameron is able to hack into the Heat Seeker and uses a modified Atari 2600 joystick to control the ship to attack Godzilla. Sure is convenient Monique added that extra artillery today. The crew is able to regain control of the ship, but Cameron's Atari controller can also operate the mechs and uses one of them to try and kill Nick and the others. Yeah, Cameron's really out for blood this time around. Though with the power of teamwork, our heroes split into groups and try and stop each of the lizard slayers, which they manage to accomplish. Hank, Dale, and Bill go back to jail, and Cameron gets away scot-free. I don't like it any more than you, worm guy. But it's his word against those Yahoo. Yeah, not only are we going to ignore that he broke people out of prison, openly admitted to hacking a private vessel, attempted murder, and also should have a criminal record of his past crimes, but yeah, none of that matters here. This is Winters' last appearance in the show, and not only does he get away with his crimes, but he even gets the last laugh here. Based on my Lizard Slayer's outstanding performance in the field, they've just put in a hefty order. I owe it all to you. Despite the somewhat down ending, this is a really solid episode. The animation is fantastic in a lot of scenes, and the action keeps on keeping on for this one. 9 out of 10. Nigel Death, 4 out of 5. He's used to latch on one of the mechs to try and short circuit it out of the sky, and it does end up working and it goes down and explodes, but we really don't see Nigel blow up or anything. I guess he could have survived, but I'm doubtful on that. Episode 36, Vision. In this one, Godzilla battles giant mutant hummingbirds. I'd say this is on the more silly and stupid side, but the writers do something unique with the concept. So the crew pack up for California, where they meet an old college buddy of Monique's, who may or may not be a potential love interest. 
The team then encounter the hummingbirds and soon does Godzilla. Problem is, Big G can't even see the avian threats, and just swipes at the air hoping to land a hit. To aid him in battle, Craven and Randy somehow build a giant pair of glasses that are able to help Godzilla see the birds clearer. Interesting to note that Godzilla was actually supposed to wear something like this from the very beginning of the show, as a way for Nick to communicate with him, though the concept was dropped early on. We dodged a bullet on that one. Anyway, Godzilla fights and beats the birds, ditches the eyewear, and the day is saved. Now, I don't normally bring up the B-plot all that often in these because for the most part it's just nonsense that has almost nothing to do with the main story, and it's no different here. But this one's charmingly funny. Randy peeks at one of Craven's messages and misreads it to think that Craven is dying. So he hangs out with him all day and tries to give the guy an easy time, with some funny moments that made me burst out laughing. I can see it, Randy. Thanks. Anytime, pal. Anytime at all. What the fuck? 6 out of 10. Nigel Death. 5 out of 5. This happens right at the beginning of the show where Godzilla being annoyed by Craven's antics tries to atomic breath the man, but misses and ends up hitting Nigel instead. Come to think of it, he's never done that yet in the show, so better late than never. Episode 37, Underground Movement. It's not a good day for our heroes, as they're approached by a lawyer whom they've always had, who hands them a lawsuit of $5 million in property damage to the city of Miami. They seem both shocked and angry, but I don't know why. With the amount of damages they caused in the past, I'm sure this lawyer has gotten them out of even tougher situations. Anyway, Nick and the ladies attend the court hearing, leaving both Randy and Craven behind to look after things. I wouldn't have picked a better duo. The two immediately get wind of some strange creature attacking Michigan, and they go to... do something. No surprise, they go unprepared, and get stranded in the middle of nowhere for... I want to say less than a week, given how they look later, but apparently it was just several hours when the team finds them, so... yeah. We then learn that the new creature called Armillaria is a giant mutated fungus that drains amino acids from any sort of life it touches. Godzilla tosses the big mushroom out in a sandy field where it can't absorb anything and gets fried by Big G, saving all of Michigan, mostly. And apparently they won in court. The monster this time around is lacking a bit in features. It's basically a redesign of the giant germ creature from an earlier episode. Also the action this time around is kind of forgettable. But the Randy and Craven subplot was at least fun to watch. 4 out of 10. Nigel Death. Despite being a Craven episode, Nigel doesn't show up at all, which is surprising. Episode 38. Ring of Fire. Our characters catch wind of a creature attacking an oil rig and... You know, come to think of it, why is the military not getting involved in this? It's like if a mass murder was occurring somewhere, and instead of calling the police, they get Mystery Incorporated on the scene. Okay, I'm getting a little off track here. So they find what's causing the ruckus. A giant bug creature called the Fire Monster. The writers really went above and beyond for this thing. It even recycles the El Gusano roar, which I haven't mentioned till now that that roar has been reused to death in this show. It's like the Varan roar, which got reused constantly for other kaiju. Anyway, Godzilla takes down the fire monster, and Craven brings it back to Heat Headquarters behind everyone's back. Except for Randy, who of course has to stick his nose into everything Craven does. The man probably can't even go to the bathroom without Randy pestering him. They both decide to study the creature in secret and find out that the bug has methane for blood. What rotten luck for them that they decided to do this near an open fire. The fire monster gets back into the action and both Godzilla and the military show up to stop it. With of course no luck in that. Craven then sacrifices Nigel who is armed with nitroglycerin to stop the bug. And the day is saved. For now. Honestly, I can see why this episode was chosen to air very late. It's a less than average episode with a very lackluster creature. It also saddens me to know that this was the final new episode to air publicly before the show was cancelled and taken off the air. Not really going out with a bang, sadly. The final two episodes were shown in 2001 at a film expo in New Jersey, but besides that, they were considered lost media for a while until the company Mill Creek Entertainment released the entire show on DVD with the unair episodes included. Mill Creek, you've helped us kaiju fans out in more ways than one. Anyway, 4 out of 10. Nigel Death, 5 out of 5. This episode makes up for the lack of Nigel kills this season. So the robot gets trashed three separate times, with the final one being a heroic sacrifice. This one does not disappoint. Episode 39, The Ballad of Gens du Muddies. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. So a businessman by the name of Paul Damage is taking over the swamp for some reason. Okay, well it's possible he's doing so because the swamp may be sitting on an oil reserve. Because of his actions, the people of the swamp, whom we never see but one person, 
are endangered of having their homes be removed. A giant swamp creature that looks like an evolution of Man-Thing doesn't like Damage's ways and begins attacking both his businesses and Damage himself. The swamp creature also has a bond with a man named George and who may or may not be a ghost. The swamp creature then gets to Damage's estate to try and destroy it, but Godzilla comes in to fight off the monster and of course loses. Damage admits to his actions on what he's doing, gets arrested, and the swamp creature goes back to wherever it came from. This is kind of a confusing episode that I had to do a double take on just to figure out what was going on. It doesn't help that I can't understand what George is even saying half the time. He overfished the bayou, leaving the Jean du Marais hungry. He used their waters like a dump. Despite the confusing lingo, this is a very entertaining episode. 7 out of 10. Nigel death, 2 out of 5. As the swamp creature makes an appearance to our leads, it smashes Nigel in a blink and you'll miss it moment. And the robot is just simply a little torn up. Eh. Episode 40. Taurus Trap. With our final outing, the characters get word of an attack around the Jersey Shore. And of course they go to investigate. Though this time around, this arrogant douchebag named Milo Sanders keeps piercing over the Heat team with his Manhattan Monster Liner Tours. This guy has absolutely zero respect for anyone and anything but himself. He even risks the safety of others just to put on a show. If this is real life, I'd sadly say people would actually behave like this. Anyway, the mutant this time around is a giant frogfish that wandered into shallow waters and is attacking passing vessels due to it being agitated by the bright lights. The team then decide instead Instead of killing it, they are going to instead lure it back to the dark depths of the ocean by tranquilizing it. But the plan goes south after the darts hit Godzilla by accident. But in the end everything goes okay and the big fish gets to live the rest of its life away from humanity. Now for Milo. Milo sneaks into forbidden territory and finds one of the tapes exposing Godzilla's underground location. But Audrey comes in to stop him from doing so. It's a nice little callback to the film where she took one of Nick's tapes to try and get a story for the news. So it's kind of cool that she's redeeming herself here on that one. Milo, however, does get away in the heat helicopter, which they have for this one and only episode, and manages to get the tape on TV, but not before being cut off to a news bulletin about a stolen chopper, which of course was Milo's act, getting him arrested. And everyone's happy, mostly. 7 out of 10. Nigel death, 5 out of 5. So Nick Craven and Nigel are trying to lure the dweller into the deep depths of the ocean, but the water pressure comes into play and nearly sabotages the whole plan. But not for sabotaging Nigel completely, at least he went out swinging. Even if this isn't the true final episode, everything does seem to have a nice bit of closure, for the most part. The writers of the show never had a true ending in mind, and regardless on whether you're watching Taurus Trap or the actual final episode Freak Show, the series is ultimately left open-ended to continue the adventures of both Heat and Godzilla. Out of all the animated Godzilla shows, this one is my personal favorite. It doesn't have the slow pacing problems the old cartoon had, and doesn't have you sitting through mountains of exposition like in Singular Point. It's a fun little monster of the week type show that you can just chill out and shut your brain off to. If you're a fan of the more cheesier Godzilla action, then this is highly recommended. The next big review is going to be the Rankin Bass King Kong cartoon from the 60s, but before then I'll throw in some more smaller videos here and there to keep you preoccupied. I'm sure you guys know how this works now. Anyways, thank you for watching towards the end, and I'll see you next time. Alright, fish your hand over your lunch money. Penelope? It's Nell. Okay, Nell. Do you watch Fox Kids? Yes. No. You should watch Godzilla. Why? <laughs> No reason.